Training your brain to spot a covert narcissist has always been difficult, yet the stakes have never been higher. Look at this. This is an article I came across from the wildly popular website Charlie Health that says, Experiencing a relationship with a narcissist will lower your self-esteem, ruin your ability to form healthy relationships, can cause mental health issues like PTSD, anxiety, and depression, manifest physical health problems, and significantly raise your chance of suicide. Here's the rub. Covert narcissists are a little like sleeper agents. They blend seamlessly into their social environment, all the while concealing their true intentions. Now, much like a sleeper agent who lives in ordinary life until a specific trigger prompts them into action, covert narcissists may not reveal their manipulative, entitled, or superiority-seeking behaviors until a situation threatens their ego or presents an opportunity for gain. They stay unnoticed until the time is right. And today, I'm going to teach you how to spot them. Look at this. These are the covert narcissists three tells, essentially the character traits that they think they have hidden from you. But in reality, there's just enough there to give them away. All right, let's zoom in here to tell number one. Their lies are so effective that they can even fool themselves. So it's interesting, in my research for this video, I actually found that there's a covert narcissist test that you can take. It has 23 questions, and as far as I can tell, each question focuses primarily on the self, often at the expense of others, with a heightened sensitivity to how others perceive or treat them. So I did what one naturally does in these circumstances. I took the test, and I scored a 34 Point eight, which according to the test is within a normal population range. Yet I want you to look at something. This is a quote I found on Good Men Project from psychologist Erin Leonard. She says that narcissists really believe their own lies. This is because in their minds, they simply twist the reality to match their beliefs. It's an extreme form of cognitive dissonance. So let's go back to that narcissist test. Like I said, there are 23 questions. And it's pretty obvious from the way these questions were phrased that I could fool this test if I really wanted to. For example, this question here. I have problems that nobody else understands. I answered this question as disagree. I'm pretty sure every person on this planet can understand the problems I have. Now, a narcissist, on the other hand, should answer this question as agree. They would likely think that no one in the world can understand the problems that they're going through. So for fun, I decided to retake this test, but this time I decided to answer it exactly how I thought a narcissist would answer it. And as predicted, I scored extremely highly as a covert narcissist, 100%. Here's my point. A covert narcissist, someone who is so adept at lying to themselves and believing those lies will see a test like this and answer it for what they believe to be the truth. It's just that their truth is based on the lies that they've been telling themselves. And you'll notice this in their behavior as well. It's not so much that they tell outright lies, it's just that they misinterpret interpret their reality, which is a lie, as a fact, when the reality is that it's really fiction. The ancient Romans had a famous phrase that they used to say, facta non verba, which translates to deeds, not words, or to Americanize this show, don't tell. Things get really tricky with covert narcissists because of the fact that they misrepresent their reality in this way. And they're really convincing with it. Yet it's a nuanced fiction. Often you'll find that there's subtle grains of truth embedded in their lies, which of course makes it really difficult for you to figure out what's truth and what's a lie. And covert narcissists are extremely good at making you believe that you're misrepresenting your reality when it's the other way around. But I did come up with something to help people kind of navigate this. Check this out. This is your own personal lie detector. And it is comically simple. If someone's words match their actions, then they're likely telling the truth. If those same words and actions don't align, then they are likely not telling the truth. 
Applying this basic framework to covert narcissists can work, but it is going to take some brain power on your part. This is Alex. He is a covert narcissist. You just started dating him. Now he claims to be deeply committed to environmental conservation. Often you'll see Alex speaking passionately about the importance of reducing plastic use, but he's a covert narcissist. He doesn't really care. Anyways, Alex shares stories about his efforts to live a more sustainable life. He participates in local cleanup campaigns, advocates for environmental causes on social media. Oh, and he claims to drive a Tesla, you know, for the environment. Now, Alex is super vocal about his disdain for unnecessary plastic and often criticizes others for not being ego conscious. And at first, you're buying into Alex's whole spiel. You're in that honeymoon phase together, but a few months into your relationship, you notice something odd. Mm. When observing Alex's actions, you start to notice there's a inconsistency with his words, specifically about the environment. Despite his proclaimed commitment to avoiding plastic, you notice that Alex really uses plastic a lot. He makes no effort to recycle it or reduce his own personal waste. Despite bragging to his friends about his new Tesla, you find out that he doesn't really have a Tesla at all. He drives a gas guzzling vehicle to work every single day. Oh, and his participation in environmental cleanups, it's more for show on social media. He just basically showed up took a few pictures to look like he's being involved and then went straight home. Now you have fallen for Alex. You're not going anywhere. So at first you start excusing these small lies, but the longer you stay in this relationship, the more inconsistencies you start to notice about his reality. Like how Alex frequently boasts about his professional achievements, claiming to have played pivotal roles in successful projects and to be highly respected by his peers. However, you start to notice that he's often passed over for promotions and his colleagues always seem to keep a polite distance from him. Oh, or the fact that Alex presents himself as this financially savvy and stable individual, often giving advice about investments and savings. But you observe a lot of inconsistencies here as well. There's a lot of financial irresponsibility, excessive spending on luxury items, reluctance to split costs fairly, complains about money when it comes to necessities or commitments to others. His words and actions don't match. Now, the longer you are with a covert narcissist, the more you're gonna start finding these little inconsistencies about the way they represent their lives and the way their lives are actually run. And that leads us pretty seamlessly to tell number two, how you feel when you are with them. Now, I'm gonna do something weird here and criticize my own video. This one right here that you're watching. My biggest problem with articles or videos like this, you know, the one, the three tells or five signs, nine tells, nine things to look for, is that often the most effective indicator for identifying covert narcissism lies from within. It's all about how you feel after your interactions with them. Checklists of tells like I'm guilty of doing here right now often can lead you to mistakenly identifying ordinary individuals as being a covert narcissist due to your own past experiences with maybe a real narcissist. So why am I doing a tells concept with this video? Well, honestly, it's the only way a video like this will ever get any clicks or attention. So you almost have to play this game that you don't like playing just for the sake that the message will get out and hopefully positively impact multiple individuals. So here we are. Anyways, remember, Covert narcissists are a lot like sleeper agents. They're adept at camouflaging, yet your gut is your best weapon. In my last narcissist video, I talked a lot about this concept of the uncanny valley, which is this area right here. Now, essentially, it's this concept proposed by Masahiro Mori, who was a professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology way back in the 1970s. Now, he used the uncanny valley to explain that as robots became increasingly human-like in their appearance and intellect, they became more appealing. Yet, there is a specific threshold at which they began to appear eerie or unsettling. This, of course, is the uncanny valley, and it's probably one of the best ways to identify some Someone with covert narcissism. Now, in my last video on narcissism, people loved this idea. 
But it was actually something this commenter said that I felt like summed the whole thing up perfectly. She said that when you were talking about that off feeling that you can't pinpoint, that's so extremely accurate. It's like you know something's off and you know something's wrong, but you don't know what in their personality just almost seems robotic at times. Yet this kind of got me thinking. How many people who are in a relationship with a covert narcissist are actually aware of the fact that they're in a relationship with a covert narcissist? Now, I looked for days, and this is not an exaggeration, and I couldn't find anything about this topic. It's not that no one had ever thought to ask the question. The problem lies in the fact that narcissism in and of itself is a little difficult to study. Check this out. This is an article from Aaron Pincus from the Department of Psychology and Pennsylvania State University that talks about four inconsistencies when it comes to studying narcissism. You have different definitions, diagnosis confusion, terms mix up, and normal versus problematic narcissism. Now let's kind of study these for a little bit. Let's zoom in on different definitions here. Imagine you have different teachers in various subjects like math, English, and science, and all of them are trying to explain to you what a circle is, but they all use slightly different definitions. Some might focus on the round shape of the circle, others on the mathematical formula that creates a circle. Some might even start talking about spheres. Yeah, we're, we're looking at you, science teacher. Now, this is actually really similar in how experts in clinical psychology, social psychology, psychiatry have different views of what narcissism might actually look like. And it makes it really hard to have one clear picture. And then things get muddied even worse when you enter into diagnosis confusion. Now, think of of this, like how every school has its own set of rules for what counts as an A grade. Because there isn't a universal standard for diagnosing narcissistic personality disorder, experts often disagree on who has NPD and who doesn't have it, which makes studying and treating it really complicated. And it often leads to comments like this. All of a sudden, everyone is a narcissist. Then of course you have the people who mix up terms. You're either a covert narcissist, an overt narcissist, a grandiose narcissist, or a vulnerable narcissist. It's kind of like sorting books into genres, yet you're not really considering that some books might fit into multiple categories or don't really neatly fit into any. And then of course you have normal versus problematic narcissism. There's a really tricky line between someone having a few narcissistic traits, like being a bit self-centered at times and having full on narcissistic personality disorder. It's a little like trying to decide when exactly someone goes from being sort of tall to all the way tall. Here's the point. No one studied if you'd be aware that you're dating a covert narcissist because no one can seem to agree on how to define those characteristics. So a lot of times what you find is the studies out there are almost looking at the very overt, grandiose type of narcissist and sort of leaving covert narcissist by the wayside. So I actually decided to come up with a framework that I thought better described narcissism as a whole. So rather than saying a narcissist is covert, overt, vulnerable, grandiose, I think it's best to look at narcissism as if it's on a spectrum, this spectrum. Now at this end of the spectrum, we have obviously overt grandiosity. This is where the narcissistic traits are loud, visible, and unmistakable. Now, individuals found here tend to be really confident. They'll seek admiration aggressively, and they'll display a sense of entitlement. So essentially, this end of the spectrum represents the stereotypical image of narcissism that you would expect. Now, on the other end, we have the covert vulnerable end. Now at this end, we obviously have covert vulnerability. It's characterized by sensitivity to criticism, feelings of inferiority masked by a superficial self-esteem and a more introverted nature. What you tend to find is that covert narcissists might not openly seek admiration, but they still inside harbor a strong sense of entitlement and superiority internally. Their tactics are more about manipulation and playing the victim to achieve their ends, which actually makes it harder for others to see the narcissism at play. Now here's the real reason that I like viewing narcissism on a spectrum. Throughout the spectrum, there's a considerable overlap and interplay between these types. You might have an individual who will display characteristics from different points on the spectrum, depending on the situation, their emotional state, or just simply over time. So yes, it's entirely possible that a covert narcissist can shift and become a grandiose narcissist over time and 
vice versa, which leads us to our third big tell. Don't expect a covert narcissist to stay covert forever. Let's seize upon my theory with the spectrum. I'm basically arguing that someone who has covert narcissism can shift and become a grandiose narcissist over time. I'd actually like to amend that statement. I would like to argue that pretty much every covert narcissist will eventually fold at some point and you'll start to see some grandiose traits leak out. It's in their nature. Look at this. This is a statement on a study regarding narcissism. It basically says that in the general population, self reports of trait grandiosity and vulnerability are unrelated or only weakly positively related, which points to relatively independent personality configurations. So basically people don't view themselves as grandiose or vulnerable. Yet later on in the study, you get this statement. However, it has been posited that those high in grandiosity can fluctuate between grandiose and vulnerable state, which is evident in informant reports. Here's where it gets really interesting. Even if most people don't see grandiose and vulnerable as this connected thing, studies show that the more someone leans into their grandiose confidence side, the more they might actually flip to feeling vulnerable or sensitive in certain situations. It's sort of like if the star football player who usually dominates the game suddenly feels left out or criticized, they might start showing their vulnerable side more. So researchers have pinpointed that this switch is most likely to occur in those who exhibit very highly grandiose narcissistic traits. So while a grandiose narcissist might walk around feeling like they're in control of the world or that they're on top of the world, if you put that person in a certain situation, that situation can trigger them to start exhibiting more covert characteristics. And the wildest part is that the grandiose person won't even admit it to themselves. Yet I'd like to add on to here with an observation that I have had. The study makes it clear. Researchers think that someone with grandiose or overt narcissism, which if you need a refresher, that's the opposite of covert narcissism, which is what this video is about, is a lot more likely to exhibit vulnerable or covert traits. But it's usually something that triggers the grandiose narcissist to behave in this way. Let's go back to our star football player. He's a grandiose narcissist. And let's say that he doesn't exactly show up to practice on time. After all, why would he need to practice? He's so much better than everyone else. So after a week of skipping practice on the day of the big game, his coach comes to him and benches him. This is what causes the grandiose narcissist to start displaying more covert characteristics. Well, here's my theory. Covert narcissists likely can do the same thing in reverse. My dad growing up was a human resources manager for corporate McDonald's. Part of his job was to keep track of all the franchise owners in his area. Now McDonald's is known for like making every new franchise owner study this very specific internal handbook. Think of the handbook as like the rules of success. You follow the handbook and your franchise will thrive. You don't follow it, your franchise won't usually survive. So he'd go around to the franchise owners every single month or so to audit how many of them would be following this handbook. And inevitably he'd encounter a few who wouldn't be following it. And as a result, their restaurants would be among the worst in the area. So he'd be forced to reprimand them. And always their response would be the same. I'm sorry, I'll do better, I'll change, you'll see. And at first, they would. There would be a change. They'd follow the handbook and get some success. But ever so slowly, as time crept forward, as they became forgotten by the corporate overlords, the bad habits would creep back in. They'd throw the handbook out, go back to their old way of doing things, and then months later, my dad would have to visit them again, and the process would start over again and again and again. No, I'm not saying McDonald's franchise owners are narcissists. What I am saying is that it's human nature to always put your best foot forward. But given enough time, your true self will emerge. My theory is that covert narcissism is a front. And given enough time, the grandiose traits that the covert narcissist is so adept at hiding can't help but leak out in subtle ways. If you ever dive into Carl Jung's work, he talks a lot about this concept of a facade or a persona. Now the facade is essentially a false persona or mask that a person presents to the world, which is designed to make a specific impression on others while concealing the true nature of the individual. A covert narcissist is an expert at blending in. Yet 
At their core lies a deep-seated sense of superiority and entitlement, which they conceal beneath a veneer of charm and humility to manipulate and control those around them, all the while protecting that fragile ego from exposure and criticism, given enough time, given certain pressures, which are kind of just exerted by living life and going through life. Even the stoutest covert narcissist will begin to leak out grandiose traits. Their facade will crack. They'll exhibit arrogance, seek constant admiration, fantasize about unlimited success and power, feel entitled, exploit you. And when that happens, well, you'll know for sure you're with a covert narcissist.